Let's try to make sense of the halo and all variations in their usage across art history. In the most general sense, the halo has been used to indicate important people in art, ranging from saints and angels to rulers and heroes. But most commonly, it is used for holy people. The introduction of the halo was primarily for practical reasons, as it helped viewers to identify the holy people in a painting. As an example, this is a crucifixion scene from 1490 by Jacopo Bellini. We can see Jesus with a halo, and there are four women on the left and one man on the right side of the painting with a halo surrounding their head. It's an easy way to identify the holy people present at the crucifixion. Based on biblical sources, we know that the man must be the disciple John, and based on John 19 verse 25, the four women are the Virgin Mary, her sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. On top of this practical element, the halo also has a more spiritual meaning. The idea is that a person with a halo is illuminated by God's grace, and they can use that light in turn to illuminate others. Or more simply said, the halo reflects the positive aura of the person. The halo comes in many shapes and has various alternative names like a nimbus, aureole or gloriole. In this video we will look at the evolution of the halo and the different types of halos. And next week we will look into more depth at what the meaning of these different shapes is. Before the middle of the 15th century, most halos in Christian art were solid gold circles surrounding the head of a holy person. Giotto's painting from around 1300 leaves no doubt that we are looking at two holy people, in this case Jesus and Saint Francis. And because gold is abundant in some of these paintings, the presence of the halo is accentuated by the inscription of some patterns within the halo. Another good example is from a few years later, this painting by Simone Martini shows an angel with a solid halo around its head. Not standing out as much because of the abundance of gold in the background, but a subtle pattern inside of it makes the presence a little bit clearer. In this work from the late 14th century, we can see exactly who the holy and non-holy people are which are the people responsible for the beheading of St. Catherine of Alexandria. And still, in 1450, this heavenly scene of the Last Judgment by Fra Angelico shows that all figures in heaven are holy. Similarly, this nativity scene from 1445 leaves no doubt that there are three holy people. Look at this busy composition by Botticelli showing the adoration of the Magi. There are only two people with a halo, which are the parents of Jesus, and they are surrounded by non-holy people. Maybe surprisingly, Jesus does not appear to have a halo, at least as far as I can see, and this goes back to a tradition from around the 2nd century AD, where Jesus was only depicted with a halo after his baptism by Saint John the Baptist. That goes back to a somewhat complicated theological argument that Jesus only represented the word of God after his baptism. But the halo is not an accurate reflection of reality. In some way it's a bit comical to paint a large golden circle around someone's head. During the High Renaissance, artists wanted to paint their subjects more naturalistically and foremost among them was Leonardo da Vinci. His painting of Saint John the Baptist was supposed to be realistic and intriguing and he didn't need a halo to indicate who he painted. Similarly, this painting showing Jesus, his mother Mary and her mother Saint Anne does not include any halo, even though most of his colleagues would put a halo around them. You may argue that these characters are so famous among religious people that they don't need a halo. But the idea of naturalism was followed by many other artists after, even when painting lesser known saints like in this painting from 1556 of Saint Jerome meditating by Jacopo Bassano. 
Da Vinci was not the first one to omit the halo, but he was certainly influential in spreading this idea in Renaissance Italy. For example, when Da Vinci was still a kid, Piero della Francesca painted this nativity scene without any halos. And even before that, artists from the early northern Renaissance like Jan van Eyck already omitted the halo, an idea that was only followed by some artists in northern Europe. So, in between this solid golden halo and no halo, there are many variations in how artists depicted holy people in Christian art. During the 15th century, artists started to experiment a bit with the shape of the halo. The solid golden halo from the medieval period was slowly replaced by some more elegant halos. Inspired by increasing realism, the solid golden halo showed no correct perspective and so more transparent and subtle halos following the laws of perspective were considered. Let me share two funny examples. An important disadvantage was that the solid halo could block important parts of the painting. Around 1310, Duccio, for example, wanted to paint Christ with his disciples around the table. But painting a halo around the disciples in the foreground would interfere with the rest of the painting. So, only half of the disciples has a halo here. Clearly not an ideal solution. And Pisanello liked to paint some of his figures with large hats. So even though the man on the right is a saint, the halo is omitted as he did not see a good solution to include both the hat and a solid halo. So artists innovated. In 1456, Andrea Mantegna included a somewhat transparent halo including various circles within the halo. And in this Madonna and Child with Angels from 1468 by Botticelli, the halo contains dots of gold, so that we can see a bit through the halo. A few years later, in the 1470s, Filippino Lippi captured the angel on the right with a circle-shaped golden line with even more subtle dots of gold inside. And again a few years later, Lorenzo di Credi painted Our Lady and the young Saint John the Baptist adoring the child, and the halos here are gold but transparent, so that we can still see the background of the painting, like the flowers above the head of baby Jesus. It was a quick evolution of increasingly more elegant halos, where artists built on each other's ideas. And soon the halo became just a subtle, circular-shaped line, as in this painting indicating the presence of Saint Jerome by a subtle circle in gold. The circle appears even more faint in this painting from 1506 by Raphael and in many other of his works. The idea went all the way to super faint circles, like in this 17th century work by Guido Reni, where you can only see the halo if you pay very careful attention. And as we saw before, even during the 15th century, there were already artists like Da Vinci and Van Eyck who abandoned the idea of the halo completely. However, at the Council of Trent in 1563, it was strongly recommended that the halo was included in religious works to ensure that the religious message was central to the painting and that aesthetics were only a secondary concern. So the halo did not become an idea of the past, as many artists still used it, and even today. Look for example at these two works from the early 20th century by the British artist Marianne Stokes, still showing the Virgin with a halo, reminiscent of the way they were depicted in 15th century Italy. Over time, there have been many more variations of the halo, and we get into more depth on this subject in next week's video. But let me give a few examples, like this one by Paolo Veronese in his feast in the house of Levi, where the disciples and other guests have no halo, but Jesus does have some subtle yellow light radiating above his head. We can see a similar idea in this painting from around 1540 by Paris Bordone, where some subtle gold rays emit from Jesus' head. A few decades earlier, Botticelli made this idea much more explicit in his painting entitled Christ Crowned with Thorns Showing Large Golden Rays. 
There are also paintings where Jesus is shown with a so-called cruciform halo, where a cross is inserted within the halo, like in Fra Angelico's Last Judgment, clearly separating the halo of Christ from the other holy figures. And like this, there are many intriguing variations, and next week we'll try to figure out if there's any logic or special meaning behind the different types of halos, especially when looking at paintings that include different types of halos for different people. Well, I hope you found this introduction to halos in art interesting. If you enjoyed this, please help the channel by subscribing, hit the notification bell and the thumbs up button and share your thoughts in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching.